Come on, give Jesus a shout of praise tonight. Give him your all. Come on, give the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords a high praise. Wow. Are you a child of God tonight? Well, you're a part of a royal family. Hey, take a seat tonight. You are going to be blessed as you bless God. God is blessing you. And I believe that you're here at the right place at the right time. Welcome to Free Chapel. What an honor it is to worship God together tonight. And I know you've come expecting. I know you're hungry. I know you're stirred. And God will meet you at your hunger and he will exceed your expectation. Do you believe that tonight? What an honor it is tonight to have some amazing ministry guests with us. Tonight, it's my honor to introduce a friend and co-laborer in the ministry. Tonight, Caleb Worley comes from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He is the executive director of Empowered 21, which is a ministry outreach from Oral Roberts University. Uh, He's known as a kingdom leader, a ministry mobilizer, relationally gifted visionary. He has over 20 years of experience in executive leadership. He was telling me earlier that last year, he and his wife, Sarah, through their nonprofit, they dug a well a week in third world countries, 52 water wells they dug last year. They were missionaries in Asia and continue to pour their heart and soul into that country as well as 60 other countries around the world. They're church planters and focused on helping ministry leaders from around the world unite under the cause of Christ. Will you do me a favor and give a free chapel welcome tonight to our friend Caleb Worley. Come on, free chapel. what he's done for you. We serve a good God. Just remain standing for a moment, if you would. What an honor to be here tonight with you at this amazing church. You know, you can sense the presence of God in this place, and it's not by accident. It's intentional that it's been designed because there's something about the presence of God that changes us. Isn't that right? And so tonight, my prayer is simple. My prayer is that you would have an encounter with God that you would hear a word from God and that you would leave changed by God. See, it's not about a song, a place, a person, a stage, a building, but it's about encountering the one who knows all, who loves you, who has the best in store for your life, and he can help you get to that place you need to be. Come on, are you grateful tonight? You know, this this ministry is literally changing lives all around the world. Uh, You maybe haven't met me before, but uh, I'm actually a Free Chapel member. I just watch online every week, and I stay up to date. I was with you on the fast for 21 days. Actually, I went a few days longer because I knew I was going to be here today. And, you know, I just want to honor the amazing leadership of this house. I think that Pastor Jensen and Cherise are two of the best leaders and pastors, Christians, and people on the planet. So can we honor your pastors tonight? We love them. We appreciate them. You know, Pastor Jensen is not just a great preacher. He's a great person. And I always love it. The closer you get to a leader, you get to see what they're really like. And I love it when I get closer to leaders that from afar, I think I really want to know that person. I want to see what they're like. And I love it when you get closer, you actually admire them more. You know, sometimes you get closer and you say, I wish I was kind of far away. But I love the fact that you have safe leadership in this house, the whole team. An amazing team from Tracy and Brian and all the campus pastors. Can we give it up for all the staff, all the leadership? We appreciate you guys. We love you. 
and I'm excited tonight because uh, a lot of times I travel different countries around the world and my wife can't travel all the time with me because we have two children at home in Tulsa, but my wife Sarah is with me right here on the front row. I'm excited that she's here tonight. She's the wife of my life. We've been married now 17 years. I married my pastor's daughter, and to be honest, it was more frightening to ask him to date her than it was to ask her to marry me. And I'm grateful that she said yes all those years ago, and I don't plan on having another one. I like the one that I have. How many of you are grateful for your spouse? So do this with me as you're standing on purpose tonight, because you're going to be seated for a few minutes. What would it look like in your life if God really spoke something to you tonight that would take you to another level? You know, what would that look like for your family, for your business, for your marriage, for your children? And before you think about answering that, let me ask it this way. Do you think your life would be better or worse if you had a touch from God tonight? How many of you think it's going to be better? So here's an interesting thought. You can actually determine ahead of time what you're going to receive. Now, I know that only three of you believe that. Because most of the time we're coming with an expectation, oh, so-and-so, oh, I'm going to get this, I'm going to receive this. But in reality, you get what you expect. Now, you're a Wednesday night crowd. I know I grew up in church my whole life. Wednesday night crowd, I mean, that is a great crowd because you already have intentionality to show up at a time when normal people don't show up. So you're not like everybody else. It's easy to be ordinary and average, but you're uncommon. In Spanish, we say fuera de lo común. You're against the common, right? So you already have that going for you, but do you want to go a little further tonight? Or is it enough to sing a few good songs? Or would it be all right in 23 minutes if God delivered something to your heart and your mind and your life and your spirit that would take you further than you've been before? Isn't that why you fasted? Isn't that what you've been praying for? So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Get your faith out there because so many times in Scripture, when Jesus would show up on the scene, he would say things to people regardless of their situation. And he would say, be it unto you according to your Six of you believe that. Be it unto you according to your faith. Did you know that he doesn't determine the level of your faith? Are you waiting for God to determine the level of your faith? He's already made up his mind. He's waiting for you to determine what is the level of faith that you're going to have. Are you going to believe when you read in the Bible where he says that with him all things can be possible? Or have you already discounted your situation because it seems impossible? So, well, all things are possible except my situation. Come on, friends. Get your faith in agreement with what God's Word says. So right now, in this moment, close your eyes all over this place. And let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. To invade this room so that we leave here not just the same as we came, but we leave different and changed through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for your children. I pray for this time that we have together, and I ask that you would speak through me, deliver your word to your people, and help us to leave this place different than we came. Lord, whatever they're going through, whatever they're dealing with, whatever challenges that they have been up against and they've been believing for the breakthrough, maybe they haven't seen it. Maybe they didn't see it in 21 days or 22 days. But, Lord, I, I thank you that you have the answers. I thank you that you have the breakthrough. I thank you that you have the strength. And I pray for faith to be strengthened in this place, that, that they would rise up on the inside even if they don't see it on the outside. Lord, give them eyes to see what you see, ears to hear what you are telling them in this hour. 
Help us to see the hurting, the broken, the lost, those that you've called this church to reach. Help us not to be satisfied with where we are, but help us to look upon the horizon and have an expectation of faith that we can't stay where we are because we understand that you have called us to reach a hurting and a broken world. And I ask that you would use every person in this place tonight. If you believe that, give somebody a high five, tell them amen. All right, you can be seated. Now, that wasn't the message. I was just getting you stirred up. You know, you should be excited because you finished 21 days of prayer and fasting, and now you can eat Chick-fil-A. Be honest. How many of you in the last few days when the fast finished, you went and had some Christian chicken? You know, it's almost like going to church. You see all the church there. Tell somebody next to you, you look happier than you did the other day. Now this one will really make them feel good. Tell them you look skinnier than you did last time. Everybody loves to feel better about how skinny they are. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 11. We'll begin reading a passage of scripture that will set the tone for where we're going to go tonight. In Acts chapter 18, it's an interesting passage of scripture. It's where the Apostle Paul has uh, endeavored to plant a church in the city uh, of Athens, and he was actually ran out of town. He was called a fool and a babbler. He had walked 53 miles to the next city of Corinth, and he is about to reach out to the people in Corinth, but yet he's almost at a crossroads in his journey. He's, he's at a place in his ministry, and he's in a situation where he needs some encouragement. Have you ever been in a place where you just need some encouragement? Maybe this morning, maybe on the way to church. We're, we're all in those situations at different times and different seasons in our life, and I find it interesting what happens here in this situation with the Apostle Paul. Starting in verse 9, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in, at night in a vision, and he said, Don't be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack or hurt you, for I have many people in the city waiting for you. And in verse 11, listen to what it says. And so he continued there. He continued there. Two simple words I want to share with you tonight. Continue and cooperate. Did you know that many times in our lives, we can find ourselves in situations where we don't know what to do? We, we don't know how to move forward. We know what we're supposed to do, but we don't know how to do it. And inevitably, in those seasons, God usually sends someone or a person or a word that helps us in that season to continue. Maybe right now in your situations, you're thinking about the circumstances of your life, and you're asking yourself the question, can I even continue in this area? I mean, I did what pastor told me to do. I've given, and I've prayed, and I've sowed, and I've served, and I've done everything I know to do, but yet you still are at a place where you're wondering, can I even move forward? Can I move forward in this marriage? Can I move forward with this business? Can I move, move forward with the dreams and the visions that God has given me with what I'm called to do? Can I even continue? Well, if you're at that place or you're in a situation in your life where you're wondering, how can I continue? Let me encourage you, you're in good company. Because the Apostle Paul, one of the, the greatest, you know, early church of fathers, he was at a place where he was doing everything that God had asked him to do, but yet we find him in this situation. Now, if you're wondering, how do we know that he was in this situation where he couldn't even move forward? When God himself has to show up in a dream and a vision and encourage you in the middle of the night to keep moving, you're probably not doing so good. But the good thing is this, God knows exactly where you are. He knows what you've gone through and he knows what you're expecting or seeing on the horizon and he'll speak to you where you are but he never wants to leave you in that place. He always wants to help push you forward. And I love in this passage that after the Lord gives him some promises, the scripture says, and so he continued there. There's something powerful in our lives when we determine that I'm just going to continue. 
I'm going to continue with what God has called me to do. I'm going to continue with what God's word says that I should do. I'm going to continue declaring even when I don't see it. I'm going to continue believing even if other people aren't believing. I'm going to continue in my sowing even if I haven't reaped a harvest yet. Why? Because we know what the Bible says. I mean, last time I read Genesis, which was, you know, this month because it's the beginning of the month, the beginning of the year. It says, as long as the earth remains, there's going to be what? Seed time and harvest time. What if the harvest you've been believing for is already with you? It's just in the form of a seed. You say, Pastor, I don't have enough. Well, you probably do. You just want a harvest and you haven't sown the seed. You haven't sown the seed of resource, the seed of obedience, the, the, the seed of giving, the seed of serving in some area. Because the Bible says, as long as the earth remains, is the earth still remaining? Then what? There'll be seed time and harvest time. So if you're in that sowing season, don't stop. Because what comes on the other side of that? Harvest. 18 people believe that. All right. I'll go back up on the stage. I'll try to be proper and I'll contain myself. Just think about it for a moment. There is power in continuing. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you used to run cross country or track when you were growing up? All right, some of you. How many of you have at least watched the Olympics? Good, good, we're all on the same page now. Now, you may not be able to tell by looking at me, but once in a while, many, many years ago, when Brian had hair, <laughs> we went to college together so I can joke with Brian. I used to be a runner. I used to run miles. I used to run cross country, and I used to run long distance races, not because I wanted to, but because the coach made me do it. And so I used to run in these races. I remember one particular race when I was in high school. I was running in this cross country race, and we're about halfway through, and we're running in this area where we pass the fans and the coaches. And I remember I had extreme pain on the right side of my body, and I looked over the coach as I was running and crying now, and I'm in pain, and I looked at the coach, and I said, this to the coach. I said, coach, I can't keep going. Now, side note, never tell the coach that you can't keep going. His reply is never going to be, oh, okay, you can quit. So if you're thinking it will be different, it won't. And so I said that to him and he said, son, you can't quit. You got to keep going. And then he said this, the team is counting on you. I said, but coach, it hurts too bad. And this is another thing you should never tell your coach. I said, you don't understand. How many of you know there's a reason he's the coach? He understands. He's been there, done that. He has the t-shirt to prove it. I mean, he's the coach. He said, son, I know exactly what you're going through. And then he said these words that stay with me to this day. He said, don't quit. You're about to get your second wind. Now, I thought this was mythological. I thought that this is crazy. I thought there's no, no such thing as a second wind because I'd never been in such dire, painful situation, never ran as fast as I did that day. And so I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? He said, son, keep going. You're about to get your second wind. Just keep going. And sure enough, another half of a lap, and all of a sudden, the pain on this side started to go. The pain in my legs started to go. And I got a surge of energy, a surge of strength. And it was if I could run faster at that point in the race than I could at the beginning because I was experiencing what scientists will tell you is that your body actually has more energy stored up, but your mind is trying to tell you, stop, quit, because it doesn't want to pull on the energy from the other parts to give you energy to run even faster. And in that moment, Moment, I was experiencing the power of a second wind. And I share that story with you tonight because some of you have been at a place and you've said, I've run fast and I've done what God has called me to do. But friends, I want to encourage you. If you feel yourself getting weary or you feel yourself getting tired in some area of your life, there's power when you continue. And I came to deliver a message to someone in this room or watching this broadcast that don't stop because you're about to get your second wins. 
God's about to give you a surge of energy, a surge of vision, a surge of faith, a surge to keep going, to keep believing, to keep serving, to keep doing what God has called you to do. Because on the other side of you continuing is someone or something that God has created you for. You know, if you think about this whole idea of continuing, it's actually selfish to continue just for ourselves. I mean, if it's up to us, I'll stop and I'll go and I'll stop because I can determine the course of my destiny. But my destiny is not just about me. And your life is not just about you. Your life is always connected to someone else. So why do you need to continue? Because someone's waiting for you. I'll say that again because I don't know if you heard me. Why do you need to continue? Why do you need to keep moving forward in your faith and keep believing God for more? It's not about you. Someone's waiting on you. Someone's waiting on you. In fact, they're probably in Gainesville or Buford or Gwinnett or Spartanburg or Brazelton. Is that how you say it? They're probably crying out tonight. They're probably looking at their situation and they're probably looking at their marriage and they're looking at their finances and they don't know what to do. And you probably live near them. You probably drove past them. You probably work with them. You probably send your children to schools that they send their children to. And it's not just business as usual. As long as people are lost and hurting and broken and dying, then we have to do whatever we can to reach them. And we continue because he continued. Imagine if he would have gave up and said, it's too hard. I can't do it anymore. I, I, I've done this for three years and they don't believe me. What if he would have just said, I don't want to go to the cross. It's too painful. Give me the stripes and the crown, but I can't do that. Friends, you can continue because he continued. And he didn't continue because it would be better for him. He continued because it's better for you. And you continue because there's someone waiting on the other side of you persevering. You know, there's a reality of this that sometimes we forget. I remember the first time I was in the country of Ecuador. This is many years ago. We were there on a missions trip, and we're in this open field in a park, and we're there with a missions team, 15, 16-year-olds in this open field. And we're praying for people, doing drama, singing songs, I don't know, a variety of things that you do on missions trips. And I'll never forget this woman, as she was walking across the field that day, she heard on the microphone these young people saying things about Jesus, and we, we asked people if they needed prayer, and this woman came. She didn't hear anything else we said except, do you need prayer? She showed up and she said, I want you to pray for me. And it's interesting, as we prayed for her, she looked up, and through the translator, she asked this question. She said, why are you here? I was there with this 15-year-old girl and I looked at her and we looked at the, other, the lady and we said, well, um, we have these missionary contacts and they brought us here. And we chose to come to Ecuador. And, and that was not the answer she was looking for. And she looked at us again through the translator. She said, why are you here? Tried to give her a better response. Well, I'm here because God changed my life once on a missions trip and I love missions. That didn't work. And then she looked, and I'll never forget it. She said these words. She said, you were here because of me. She said, you're here because of me. I thought to myself, well, what is she talking about? And then she told us the story. She said, this morning, I woke up, and my husband had left. He left me a note, and he told me, I'm leaving you and the children. I can't deal with it anymore. And she said, I cried out to God. And I said, God, if you're real, I need a sign today that you're going to take care of me. And then she said this. And I was walking in the park. And I felt like God said, there's your sign. She said, God sent you here for me. Friends, never forget or underestimate why God has you on this earth and what God has called you to do. 
because it's always connected to a person and people and places because God loves people. We're gonna fast and we're gonna get breakthrough. We're gonna seek the heart of God. But why? So that God can use you to reach people. Jesus died for people and we live to reach those people. This is our calling. So the next time you think about quitting or stopping or settling in, think about the people that God has called you to reach. There's always someone on the other side of your obedience. Look at the person next to you and say, I think I'm gonna continue. You know, when God asks us to do things, it, it isn't always simple or easy, but we have a promise. We have a promise that as Jesus ascended, that the Holy Spirit descended. And Jesus gave us some instruction about the Holy Spirit. He said, he'll be with you, he'll instruct you, he'll teach you. In fact, in the book of John, it says it this way in John 16, 13, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Another translation says, he will show you things to come. I believe that God has more in store for your future, but that the delivery mechanism is gonna come through the person of the Holy Spirit. So imagine this, we, we get clear, clear eyes and we can see what God asks us to do. We, we have clarity in our ears. We hear, like John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. So we hear what he's asking us to do. We hear his voice. But there's another element beyond seeing what God has called us to see and hearing what God has called us to hear. There's an element which I will call cooperation. That if the Holy Spirit is speaking and showing us things to come, that means that we have a choice or an opportunity to cooperate. So we not only need to continue, but we need to cooperate. That there is a cooperation with the Holy Spirit that God wants us to have. He doesn't want us to think about the Holy Spirit as an it or a being far off from us because that's not why he sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit to abide with us, to lead us and to guide us, to instruct us, but we still have to choose. Think of it this way. The God that can do anything still can't do one thing. I know it's contradictory to your theology, but just go with me for a moment. The God that can do anything still can't force you to follow him. He won't force you to serve him. He allows you to cooperate. He allows you to partner. The God that created you for a distinct purpose for your life still won't bring that purpose to pass automatically. He wants to know, will you cooperate with me? You know, there are those in some theological circles that just say, almost like, que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. If God wants it to happen, then God will just make it happen. If that's the case, why did he send the Holy Spirit? I know that's hard for some of you because it's, it's fun and it's very, um, there's not a lot of personal responsibility when you say things like, well, if God wants to do it, he'll just do it. Then why are you here? God chose to have you on the earth. I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't do it and then force you to show up to free chapel on a Wednesday night. You chose. There is this cooperation. And there's actually a powerful partnership that happens when we understand the power of cooperating with the Holy Spirit. That he shows us things to come, but then we decide, I'm gonna go after the thing that he showed me. He gives us a picture of our marriage, I'm gonna go after having that kind of marriage. He gives a picture of this is what's gonna go on with our children, I'm gonna go after doing that for my children. He gives me a picture of this business and I have to go after going after that business. So there's this cooperation with what he says and what we do. And this is powerful for us to understand because as you move forward in the future, I believe God has greater things that he's gonna show you in the days ahead. Do you believe that? God has greater things that he's gonna show you. So if he shows them to you, 
then that's an opportunity to cooperate with what he's showing. You know, in my life, I've seen it so many different times where the Lord will speak something and it's not what I wanted to hear. Have you ever been there? It's like, okay, God, I'm praying on my knees, I'm fasting, I'm worshiping, I've shown up three times to church this week, I feel pretty good about my salvation. And a lot of times we're trying to navigate what we want God to do in our life. Okay, God, I want you to bring this and do this, and here's how I want you to do it. But if you've been around the family of God very long, you realize God's idea and your idea are never the same. Right? And I think sometimes he's just like, hey, okay, I had that idea, but since you have it, I'm gonna show you that's not the idea because he wants you at the end of the day to know you still have to trust him. It's not about him approving your plans. It's about you submitting your life to his plan. Come on, guys. This is the gospel. It's actually, I can say this, we're at Free Chapel. It's actually entry-level Christianity to just follow him. It's not like, oh, I'm going to follow Jesus. No, that's just the start. The old song, I Surrender All, that wasn't like down the line. That was at the beginning. That's like, if it starts that way, it continues that way. I surrender all plans, purpose, dreams, vision, whatever. Because last time I checked, I submitted my vision and my dream to him. And I got his. And that helps me to understand he's actually more concerned about the dream that he gave me than I am. Because he gave it to me. So you don't have to worry so much. God, how am I going to do what I'm called to do? Don't worry about it because God has called you to do it. What you need to understand is that I'm going to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And he'll show me exactly what to do. Let, let, me, let me point this out in Scripture. Some of you may not believe me just by testimony. There are plenty of times here in Scripture. There's one in Acts chapter 8. It's one of my favorite stories with the evangelist Philip. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. So this is the Lord speaking to Philip. Arise and go to the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Wow. Not very exciting. I just left Jerusalem last week. And when you leave Jerusalem and you go down towards Gaza, friends, guess what that is? The scripture tells us right after that, this is the desert. What a brilliant promise. Leave a cultured place. Leave a place where there's a lot of people. Now, Philip was an evangelist. He was a determined evangelist. So if you're an evangelist, you want to be around people. You want to be around as many people as possible. So here is Philip doing what he thinks God has called him to do, asking God, God bless me in Jerusalem. Help me to grow and reach and multiply. And then all of a sudden the Lord speaks to him. Arise, go out of Jerusalem towards Gaza on the road, which is the desert. Now, before you go on and read what happens in the next verse, Let's just stop and think for a moment. How would you ordinarily respond to this type of instruction from the Lord? Get out from where you are. Go to this place that you don't know because I said so. That's it. And by the way, it's kind of like a desert. Most of us, because we think wisdom is a word that we want to use, we would say, I'm using wisdom and due diligence to ask the Lord a few questions. Like this. Lord, well... Where exactly do you want me to go? And most of us wouldn't move out of park until he gives us more direct instruction, as if him speaking to you is not direct enough. We would say things like, well, how long do you want me to go there? I'm just using wisdom, Lord. How long should I be there? I have to prepare for the journey. Or something like, who am I going to meet on the road out of Jerusalem? How wonderful is the journey going to be? Or whatever question you would ask. But look at what happens in the next verse, verse 27. It's really amazing. You'll see it so many times in Scripture now that you're aware of it. It says, so he arose and he went. Wait a minute. He didn't ask any question? Tracy, he didn't like do a budget analysis on how long the journey is going to be and how much money he's going to need in his pouch and, and you know, all that. He didn't do any of that. 
He arose and he went. That is one of the most powerful statements in all of scripture. You will see this with Abraham when he said, arise and go. You'll see this with Jacob when he called him to Bethel. He said, arise and go. You'll see it with Elijah when he was at the brook and it dried up and the Lord said, arise and go. And the next verse says, so he arose and went. So he arose and went. So he arose and went. There was something about their obedience to the voice of God. There was this cooperation where I just trust if God is saying go somewhere, I'm going to go. If God is saying do something, I'm going to do it. If God is saying give something, I'm going to give it. If God is saying expand, I'm going to expand. If God is saying anything, then I'll just say, okay, it's God. But somewhere along the line in Western theological thought, we have come into the place where we think that we can navigate what God wants us to do by asking so many questions. But I think it's actually simpler than we make it. He's just looking for obedience. He's looking for cooperation. And I find it very interesting that he points out you're going to go to the desert. Because most of us would blame the desert on the devil. Lord, are you out there? I'm in the desert. Hello. There's not a lot of people in the desert. I'm an evangelist. I need a lot of people. There's not a lot of resource in the desert. Is the devil sending me to the desert? What if there's a discovery of your destiny in the desert that you're not even aware of? For Philip, he went out on this road. He didn't know why he was there. And then all of a sudden, there's a guy. There's a chariot. And the guy's reading scripture, scripture that Philip was preaching. And he looks at the guy and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. Do you think it was accidental that Philip happened to be the someone on the road that day? No. It was by divine assignment. God placed him in that place. He began to explain it to him. That's a great miracle. He explains it to him. And the guy gets such great understanding. He looks back at Philip. He says, well, what forbids me in this moment to be baptized and to receive what you're telling me? Philip's like, wow, it actually worked. I've been in Jerusalem where all the people are. Nobody received me. Now there's one guy on a dusty desert road and he takes everything I say. He says, well, I guess nothing except for some water. Bam, water in the middle of the desert. Just so happened to be an oasis right there on the dusty desert road. If you've never thought about that, that is a miracle. I've driven that road. I drove that road on, on Thursday last week. I didn't see any water. I was driving from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. I didn't see any water holes anywhere. And yet all of a sudden there was water in the midst of the desert. That helps me to understand that if God calls you to be somewhere, he's going to provide for you in that place. He called you to be there. You want a ministry? Bam, there's a guy in the middle of the desert. You want provision? Wow, there's water right in the middle of a desert. Friends, I share this with you tonight to help you to understand that there's a cooperation with the Holy Spirit. That when you're hearing what he says and you're obeying what he's called you to do, it may look like a desert season, but there's destiny in the desert. There's a discovery in the desert that God has for you. So no matter what your excuse is, no matter what you've been piling up as reasons why you can't do greater things for God. I came to help you and encourage you tonight to lift your eyes and strengthen your faith and believe that if God says it, then God will do it. Come on, friends. Give God praise in this place tonight if you really believe that. So think about the Middle East for a moment. In the 1930s, after the Great Depression, the Middle East was suffering like every other country was suffering at that time. And in fact, in many of those desert, arid places, they began drilling for water because they were, they were so malnourished, they, were, they needed resource, and so they began drilling for water. And as they were drilling for water in the mid-1930s in places like Iran and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Oman and Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, Guess what they all begin to find instead of water in the middle of a desert? They found oil. Isn't it interesting the thing that they despised actually began to be the thing that provided for them? 
there was oil in the midst of the desert. And someone here tonight needs to understand that whatever you've been going through, what you need to tap into is the oil. You need to tap into that oil. You you may have been looking in other places with other things or with other people, but you need to tap into the oil of the Spirit, the oil of His presence, the, the oil of joy and strength and grace and peace that He provides for you because He has the oil. He's looking for people. We're the vessel that He's looking for. I love that story where there's a widow woman. She doesn't have anything except for a little bit of oil. And the prophet tells her, go get as many vessels as you can. Bring them in and pour the oil. And there's a statement. It says, as long as there were vessels, there was oil. There's no shortage of oil in heaven. There's only a shortage of vessels here on the earth. Will you be a vessel that can cooperate with what the Holy Spirit wants to do? When you think about the schools that need to be reached, will you be a vessel that says, God, I'll cooperate and do what you've called me to do? I'll be what you've called me to be. I don't know what your situation is, but I can tell you this. If you continue and you cooperate, you're going to see greater things than you've ever seen before. And God's going to use you in miraculous ways. Time after time, over 63 countries now, I've seen it time and time again. Some of the most rural places in the world where the gospel is preached for a few moments and people respond and their lives are changed dramatically in an instant. And I think, God, how is this possible? And he always reminds me, I just need someone. Just cooperate with what I want to do in the earth and you'll see me do even greater things. So think about the someone that's on the other side of you continuing and you cooperating tonight. Several years ago, I had an encounter, an experience on a road in Cambodia that I'll never forget. I was leaving a seminar. We ministered to these pastors. I felt like that was my assignment of why I was there. We'd been there for three days. We had a great time. And on the way out of town, I was driving on the road and I saw commotion on the side and I told the pastor to stop. I wanted to see what was happening. They found out there was a girl about 13 years old. She was riding a bicycle. A big semi came behind on the road. There's only two lane roads in the whole country. Hit her from behind on her bicycle. Knocked her to the side of the road. She was laying dead, lifeless there on the grass. And the people are just screaming. It's a Buddhist country. They don't know what else to do. They, they, they think that maybe this is God's plan for this, this person. They, they had no idea. And I looked at the pastor and said, Pastor, we have to do something. He said, we can't do anything. They're they're screaming. It's chaos. I said, no, we have to do something. So we walked over. Here's this girl. Terrible situation. I said, Pastor, we just have to pray. So I remember getting down on my knees and just beginning to pray for that little girl. Just crying out to God. You see, I thought my assignment was to minister to leaders for three days in the nation of Cambodia to help them be be smarter, better, more organized as leaders. All the things that are good and helpful. But then in that moment, I realized there's another assignment. I was praying for this girl. Three, four minutes, nothing happened. Pastor with me said, come on, we have to go. So I, I stood up and I just started to walk away. And then all of a sudden, of a sudden this girl that was there lifeless bleeding out of her head suddenly she sits up she she gasps her arms go out like this God brought her back to life in that moment he brought her back to life in that moment we helped her out got her on it car and they sent her to the hospital to help her out and, and I, I was overwhelmed in the moment I, I'd never seen that there's no manual in school that taught me okay here's what you do when you see a girl dead on the side of the road got hit by a truck nothing I'm just overwhelmed in the moment and I sit in the car and I'll never forget this is what the Holy Spirit said it's about cooperation this is what he said he said that's why you came 
That's why you came. Friends, I want to encourage you tonight. There's people, they're hurting, they're broken. And God wants to breathe new life into them, not just physically, but he wants to breathe life on the inside of them to help them to see what they can't see. Help them to hear what they can't hear. But he needs someone. And I just believe he wants to use you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all over this place? I want to pray for you tonight. In this moment, we're just going to surrender. And I want to invite the first group here tonight, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I realize as you're talking about continuing and cooperation with the Holy Spirit, I realize tonight I'm not right with God. There's stuff in my life, there's sin, there's shame, there's guilt, there's decisions I've made. I just need a fresh start. I need a new beginning. And tonight I'm going to make that decision. This is going to be my fresh start, my new beginning. If that's you all over this place, just lift your hand wherever you are. You said, that's my day. That's my night. This is my time. I need a fresh start, a new beginning. Lift your hand wherever you are. I see that hand and that hand, that hand, that hand. God bless you. God bless you. Who else? You said, this is my night. This is my night. Over here, over here in the back. You said, this is my night. I need a fresh start, a new beginning. All right. Second group I want to pray for is those of you that are in a situation and you've been at that place, maybe a crossroads in your life, and you say, I haven't had the strength to continue. But tonight I'm making that decision. I'm going to continue in that area of my life. I've even contemplated quitting and giving up in that decision or that, that covenant relationship or in that business. But tonight I realize God is speaking to me. I'm going to continue. Just lift your hand with these others. You say, that's me, that's me, that's me. God bless you. Here's what I'm going to invite you to do. Lift. Why don't you stand to your feet all over this place? And those of you that lifted your hands, would you do me the honor of joining me here at this altar because I want to pray a prayer for you. The Bible says that we can pray the prayer of faith and God will raise them up. So I want to invite you right now, if you lifted your hand on either one of those two counts, join me here at this altar. Come on, friends, give them a hand as they're coming down here. We're believing God with you. I saw that hand and that hand and that situation. Come on, come on, just come on down. You know how it is here at Free Chapel. We don't want to finish an, a service or without giving you an opportunity to be at an altar, to have an encounter with God, to worship Him, to lift up your situation, to acknowledge that without Him, you can't do it. But with Him, you can do all things. Come on, friends. You didn't come to this altar to look down. You came to this altar to look up. You didn't come to this altar to stay the same. You came to this altar because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wants to transform you in your situation. Come on, do you believe that tonight? So here's what I invite you to do. We're going to pray this prayer together and then the worship team's going to lead us in a song. It's a prayer of faith. We're all going to pray it together. Whatever reason you came down here for, God's going to transform you in this moment. If you need the strength to continue, he's going to give you the strength. If you need forgiveness, he's going to forgive you. You ready to pray? Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. All that I have is yours. Forgive me of the past and help me for the future to follow you. Jesus, you are mine. Holy Spirit, have your way in me. Strengthen me now in this moment. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray right now for every single person that's here, from the front to the back, each side. And I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would strengthen them, that not one person would leave here the same, but they're leaving different. I pray that you would give them dreams and visions of the people that you've called them to reach, the places you've called them to go, the businesses you've called them to start, the areas that they're called to serve in. I pray, God, revelation knowledge, and I pray strength that they would continue and they would cooperate. If you believe that, put your hands together and let's worship all over this place. Come on, church. Let's worship him. Go ahead.
praise tonight. Hey, you got what you came for. Hey, can you thank Pastor Caleb and Sarah for coming to Free Chapel tonight and dropping that word in our heart. Thank you so much. So proud of you and so thankful for you. Hey, look, during this coming series, we are putting our faith out there, like Pastor Caleb said. The pastor is believing to see a thousand people saved, not this year, in the next series. And look at this harvest already coming in. People already saying yes and cooperating with God. So look, we all play a part in that. Let's invite some people this weekend. Let's be some people that bring folks to church. Let's go back to the people that we've given up on. Let's give some people a second chance like God gave us in our life. I believe God's putting some people in your names, on your minds, and when you go invite them, there's, they're gonna wanna say no, but yes is gonna come out. And they're gonna meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we're gonna empty hell, and we're gonna fill up heaven for the name of Jesus' sake. Hey, come back this Sunday, pastors preaching. Can't wait to see you guys, we love you. Good night.